Okay, so I'm talking about job opportunities and threats in a digital future. So um, at the moment, we're hearing lots of things about automation and artificial intelligence. And it does sometimes feel like we're in a plot for some bizarre sci-fi film. Um, but it's not all about the bad things, and it's not a dystopia where everything is going to be taken over. We're looking at firms and businesses augmenting automation to sort of move forward, but that is going to have an impact on the labor force and the roles and the skills and the work that is carried out by people. Um, this is already kind of happening. So in February 2017, the telecoms company, O2, said they were going to bring in artificial intelligence for their customer service. And that is due for implementation in February 2018. So things are already beginning to appear on the horizon of automation and artificial intelligence coming into the workplace. Um, there's loads of information. It's gone mad in the last few months about AI and automation. We've had various headlines. Um, my favorite was the last quote, which talks about the march of the cyborgs. It really does sound like we've entered another reality, but this is our reality. And we're going to find a way to engage in this reality, to work with it, and actually to pull opportunities out of this. Um, with automation, I've got some fantastic quotes, but this is going to impact a lot on the next generation. But we are not home and free either. It is going to affect everybody. There is a lot of changes coming, and they're gradually going to creep into our workplace. In many ways, it already has. Um, from PwC, I've got a quote up there about how it's going to affect the younger age group. They, as Willie said, they're going to have jobs that don't exist at the moment, that we're going to be creating new roles for them to take part in. And as Sir Terry Leahy said, business is not going to slow this down. They are going to use it if it financially gives them better returns. So they're going to be thinking about the business end. We need to think about the employees and our skills as we go forward so that we can participate and we can be part of this. There are lots of threats and risks, and it's often now called the fourth industrial revolution um, because we've had a lot of changes. Really, the changes have ramped up a lot since the 1980s with the advent of computers coming into our offices. That was the first step. And each time we get new things. So there was the fax machine. There was the internet. There was emails. There's email marketing. Um, in our house, it's crazy. There's tablets. There's phones. There's smartwatches. Everything communicates with each other to communicate with us. So we've got to be aware that um, with all this digital technology coming in, it's going to affect us. But it's going to affect certain jobs first. Certain areas are at more risk to digital technology than others. And often, it's the areas which um, process high data or have repetitive tasks built within them. So I've got some figures up here about the most risky sectors to currently be working in. So transportation and storage. Transportation is a very high risk. We were all hearing about the driverless cars. It's been a lot in the news lately. 2021, I think, is when they're planning to have them on the roads in the UK. So that's going to affect long-distance drivers. It's possibly going to affect trains. Will we have driverless trains? Um, we can see how technology is already being they're paving the way for these things to be implemented into our workplace. So manufacturing, we've seen that in the car industry. There have been robots involved in the building of cars for years, and that's going to continue and slowly replicate itself and ripple through the workplace. So the estimate from this survey that was carried out, um, they started the survey in 2015 and collated everything in 2016, is that 30% of existing jobs are at risk of higher automation. The UK is not doing too bad. We're, we're higher than some and lower than others. But obviously, um, the US is 38, 35 in Germany, and 21% at risk in Japan. But the UK and European countries, we're all quite interested in evolving technology. And as much as we're interested in it, it does have an impact on the workers. So, 
Are we reaching a tipping point? The discussions are there. The implementation is beginning to roll in. We possibly are. I've got some interesting figures coming up on the next slide about the perception of automation affecting jobs. But at the moment, um, people believe automation is coming in, but they don't necessarily believe it's going to affect their job. It's a very personal perception. OK, so at the moment, about 65% of the population, and this is in American figures, I couldn't find any for Europe, but 65% of the population believe automation and artificial intelligence will be in and completely running, up and running within the next 50 years. But bizarrely enough, um, sorry, that was 80% believe it will be there, but only 65% believe it will have any effect on them and their employment. So it's almost like there is a disjointed attitude here between we know it's coming and how it will affect us. So it's really important as we go forward to acknowledge it's going to affect all of us. It's definitely going to affect all of us. So we need to review the way that we look at ourselves, how we skill ourselves, how we gain skills, how we continue to learn so that we can move forward and actively be part of the future rather than feeling that we have disengaged from it. So I've been talking a lot about how it will affect your employment and your working life but it also has an effect on your personal life. So access to services have also changed over the last five to 10 years. Now you can book a doctor's appointment online. I can book an eye test, I can uh, apply for my car tax, I can renew my passport, I can do an awful lot of stuff remotely using the internet and all of that. So as we move to a system where a lot of these systems are automated, we're going to find that the other forms of communication start to drop off. Because actually, it's quite affordable to have an online solution. It's not so affordable to have someone answering a telephone and making notes and then booking it onto another system. So there are cost implications that will affect the communication systems that are available to us. We are going to find other communication channels start to drop off. One of those areas is um, benefit digitalization. So now, to apply for your universal credit, which involves job seekers allowance, employment, and social support, all of these credits, it's an online portal. There is a support telephone line for people who struggle with that, but it's, it's had its issues. Um, their first priority on service delivery now is to try and get people to roll out and fill in the forms themselves rather than have another person employed to do it. So a lot of things are moving online. And I don't think that's going to disappear. But also, healthcare is moving online. There is some incredible stuff out there at the moment. So there are apps that will help you. There is online information. There are online support groups, networks for people to share the issues, to make connections. Um, but there's more than that. There, there's so much coming. Um, there's a smart pill that has been developed, and the idea is you swallow it with your medication, and it, it levels the med amount of medication in your bloodstream and relays it to a patch that you can wear on your arm, and it relays it to an app. So you know that your medication levels are correct and that you haven't taken too much or don't have enough in your system. So if you're going to be using these technologies, you have to know how to use them. You can't just have the patch on in an app and not understand how to use it. If it's the healthcare evolves, we have to have the skills to understand the information it's giving us. Bearing that in mind, it's affecting our personal lives, how we book things, how we um, access uh, services, public health, how we deal with our uh, medications. It's really important we all have digital skills. And also, we've got to be very wary about who's going to slide, potentially, out of the market. So we're looking at how we develop digital skills for the people who are most vulnerable to sliding out and being stuck in the gap where they don't have the digital skills to interact. So we're looking at getting past the rhetoric about all these words. We're looking at how do we deliver this on the ground. How do we engage with people? How do we get them to feel, actually, this is a positive, to take the opportunity to 
grab these digital skills and not feel that they need to step away. Um, so we're looking at a range of things. And one of them is about unbalancing, well, rebalancing, I should say, um, the gender gap. So at the moment, there are huge imbalances. Um, so I've got some figures there. The British Computer Society said that 17% um, of the sort of IT specialists are female. And as we heard before, females are 50% of the, the planet's population. So 17% is, is really low. Um, there were places lower than the UK, um, but there were places that were certainly higher as well. So if anybody's thinking of emigrating and you're female, Ireland's really good for females in the IT industry. Um, but just to say, um, we do need to look at making it more positive in the news. We need to show that there are women in IT. We need to change that pay gap so that women earn as much as men, that they perceive it is well worth their entering that IT market, to engage in it, partake in it, and start getting some decent earnings from it. So there's been a lot of research that has proven that disadvantaged learners are the ones that really struggle. If they came out with low GCSEs or no GCSEs, they are the ones that are going to be really hard to engage with technology and take forward, getting skills, getting into employment, using digital services, all of those things. But there's a lot of things out there, such as gamification, about creating hooks on their interests, on their subjects, on their lifestyles, that can pull them back in. So... We're looking to engage and inspire. We're looking to find out what is the audience's need and using that need to drive the programs that are delivered to them. Not everybody goes, hey, um, I want to be a programmer. But they may say, actually, I use Facebook quite a lot. And I'm actually really good at Facebook. And I share loads of information there. And I'm great at doing images on there and communicating. So we might be able to say, well, we'll use those skills to sort of pull you into social media. And actually, there's loads of jobs in social media. There's social media marketing. We can look at the skills that are out there and bring them into building on those skills, developing those skills, and making them more employable or better in skills for a better job. So we talk about transferable skills. I've got up there about the social media. They may like online shopping. They might be a whiz at using Etsy or eBay. And it's those things that we're looking to find a hook, find a draw, find what their needs are, and then building a program based on the needs of the individual. And then getting them sharing that information and communication <coughs> and building a network to step forward and hopefully have an online CV that demonstrates all those skills. So what do employers want? Well, that's changing, drastically changing with the arrival of automation and artificial intelligence. They don't want people that can do those processing jobs, those manual jobs, because they will be the first to go. That production line is going to be disappearing off into the ether with the weaving mills. So we want people to have skills rather than a job. It's not about what is your job. That dinner party thing, you introduce yourself to someone and the first thing they ask you is, oh, what do you do? We should no longer be the sum of what do we do, but how many skills do we have? What could we do? What is our potential? It should be more than what job title you have. So we're looking at being flexible, being adaptable, and appreciating the different skills that we've picked up. And obviously, creativity is something that at the moment AI has not got to. So we're going to hang on to that. It's great to be creative and look at things in a different way. Many jobs in the future will have a digital element, to say the least. They reckon that 90% um, of all jobs will have a digital element in 20 years. I, I'd almost go further and say 100% of all jobs will have something digital within them. Um, there are days when I get tired of computers and I think I'm going to go and stack shelves in a shop and just never have to deal with a program that won't open. But I've been in my local supermarket and I've heard the Windows startup music when they're prepping their scanner to put the prices on. There is no escape. Digital is everywhere. So we need to make sure that everybody has those digital skills. Um, it's estimated that, that there are, what is it, 1.2 million new technical and digitally skills people needed by 2022. 
that's a lot. That's a lot of opportunity. That is a lot of potential for new jobs and for us to find maybe a creative way to express ourselves. So Britain, um, skill shortage has been getting higher over time. It's, it's not going down. There are jobs out there. There are jobs now, and there are definitely jobs in the future that as long as you've got some digital skills and you can market those skills, you are distinctly employable. Um, it isn't necessarily an IT degree. We're looking at um, other options. So there are citizen coders, and this is growing at a grassroots level. Um, an example of this um, is that they're doing um, Twitch. I don't know if anybody knows Twitches, so bird watching. They're trying to monitor where the birds are in the UK to um, track migratory patterns and also to check the levels of those birds. So they're getting what they call um, homegrown citizen developers to log on and put the information in if they've seen those birds and where they've seen them. And they start getting people to interact with these systems, gaining basic skills, but it's hung on something they're interested in. In this case, birds and migratory patterns. And it's surprising out there how many people are interested in that. So there are other ways of coming into this. You don't necessarily come out of college knowing you want to do IT. You may come to it in an alternative route. And those routes are all valid. They all have potential. The internet is, is just a world full of potential. Um, it's an incredible resource for learning, direct and indirect. Um, I'm sure many of you here have heard of MOOCs, which is Massive Open Online Courses. They're totally free, and they give you a taster of all sorts of knowledge and training out there. Um, and they're totally free, which is fantastic. It's a great way to dip your toe into something and see, does it fit your personality? Is it the interest that you've got? Um, so it's a great way of learning. There are other systems, like Linda, which is a paid-for system, but they're all very much direct learning. There is a lot of indirect learning out there, masses of it. Something like applying filters to your Instagram picture, um, putting layers over other images and creating memes to put on social media. All of those things are valid digital skills, but not necessarily acknowledged as a valid digital skill by the person using it. Some people may not think they're very tech savvy, but actually have a huge amount of skills, just haven't acknowledged them. And the idea is that we can find some of this and get them to acknowledge it, to build on it, develop it, expand upon it, and increase it. So I've got the social media option up there. This is um, a, a huge opportunity for anybody that loves social media. Social media marketing is a job, and it's a well-paid job. Um, and it involves interacting with social media representing a business. There are a lot of people out there who do that for fun. And the thought of being paid to interact with social media is a great way forward, and it builds on your skills. Other things, self-employed. So um, self-employed or would-be entrepreneurs can also use the internet to develop their business and move further. I often start, um, we work a lot with small businesses down in Cornwall, and they often come that they've been building something on the kitchen table for years, and they go to occasional markets and they sell it. But they know that the product they've got, that they make, is unique, it's original, and it could be a goer. So we help them with learning to build websites or to learn social media so they can start putting their information out there in an online environment. So they can take nice pictures and edit them so they can put it on Etsy or Folksy or an online sales environment. We look at expanding their markets. We're supporting them to provide a business in a global environment, taking them from that kitchen sink where they were making two or three to building it into a business where they need to employ people to help them because they have a full business going. There are a lot of creative and interesting ideas out there that could be so much more once they learn how to promote themselves in a digital world and how to take it a step for, for further or forwards. So, summary of the point. AI, is, it's, it's basically here. Automation, it's coming in. It's happening, but it's not a bad horror film. This is not a dystopia. We don't need to cover our eyes and shy away from this. Actually, it's a world full of opportunity. If with our skills and our creativity and the different perceptions we have and thinking outside the box or even forgetting about boxes, we can move forward, we can create new things, we can be part of this, and not only can we be part of it, 
we can potentially influence the way it goes. And that's it. Thank you.